Good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday. It is uh, the first Thursday of uh, Behind the Screens Live from season four. So um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. We've got a uh, special guest tonight. Uh, I know we typically do Shop Talk Live from the Ghost Biker Garage on Thursday nights, but here during the month of October with the release of my season, we're going to be transitioning back to the Behind the Screams where we cover the different episodes that I release on Tuesday nights. So again, thank you all so much and welcome. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that watched the premiere last night. Uh, again, it's a little bit out of, out of our uh, typical fashion with uh, normally the first episode of um, Ghost Biker, or excuse me, of the uh, season releases the first Tuesday of the month. But uh, if, if you watched the show, you saw I was in New Mexico the first weekend of October and uh, been traveling a lot, uh, opening the historic Scott County Jail and all of that fun stuff just kind of led up to a little bit of a delay. I had hoped to release the uh, episode um, this past week, but unfortunately we, do, we weren't able to do that. I had some, some major computer issues and all that good stuff that that kind of leads to delays. So again, thank you guys so much for bearing with me. We should be back on task and on schedule now for the remainder of the episodes. And you're actually going to end up getting a uh, bonus episode this season, which I'm very excited about to uh, be able to bring that to you guys since since you had to wait an extra week for the release. So just want to say hello to a few people that are on here. Hello, Glenn. You look like you're from Scotland. Thank you so much for tuning in. That's awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on tonight's guest because I know a lot of people have different questions and we're going to talk about some of the different techniques that we used in the episode as well as some of the different things that happened. So, uh, you know, so we're going to go ahead and get into that. We may even show some clips. Um, Jake also released his episode earlier on, so we're going to be talking about that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on my friend and fellow collaborator for this first episode, Mr. Jake Fife from Fife Paranormal. Hey, Jake. Hey, Miranda. How's it going? It's going great. Again, thank you so much for joining me tonight and breaking down the episode. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's always an honor, and congratulations on the premiere of uh, the episode. I absolutely loved it. Well, good. Thank you so much. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I, you know, as I had shown in a lot of different uh, parts, and I really didn't get to talk a lot about, I had some some technical issues and battery drain from the start. I've, I've never experienced battery drain so bad as I did in this particular location. Yeah, I've, I've honestly never seen anything like that. I've, I've been on investigations where, you know, I'll see equipment fail, you know, batteries drain or stuff like that. But it seemed like basically every piece of equipment you had was just failing that night. But what was weird if, um, you know, I went back and looked at some of my footage, most of your equipment failure was like in the first, you know, half or so in the investigation. And then about after the time we did the uh, spirit box session in the um, the dining room, it seemed like it stopped messing with our equipment. And, you know, in a weird way, it started messing with us personally and physically, which I thought, you know, was very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, so so to kind of break it down, you know, we, we uh, met in uh, Glade Spring, Virginia which is um, in Southern Virginia, south, Southwestern Virginia, just there across the, um, across the line here from me in Tennessee. So I had, I had about a three and a half hour ride up. Um, how, how, about how far was it for you? It was about two and a half, three hours, something like that. You know, three after, hours after you factor in traffic. Yeah. So, so I had like charged all my equipment the night before and uh, of course we get there and we got there pretty early they let us in about about six o'clock mm -hmm. and uh, i think you had gotten there um i was there like, like five thirty. <laughs> yeah you had gotten there and I was late because of traffic so mm -hmm. you were there about an hour i think before me so you were in that house yeah. by yourself mm -hmm. And that was weird. I was hearing <laughs> stuff as soon as i walked in because um i'm love to get to events and investigations early Mm -hmm. And I got there and Rhonda and them weren't even there yet. Um, they joined us, I believe, later in the night. So, you know, I texted Rhonda, the owner of the Nickerson stand out. She's like, hey, you know, just do this for the, to get in. I was like, oh, cool. And then that's when you texted me saying that you had got 
I can't remember if it was road work or an accident or something like that. So, you know, I was just setting up my equipment, setting up our base camp. Uh, this is my third time going to that, so I knew my way around it. And within a few minutes of me being inside, I was hearing footsteps coming from upstairs. I was seeing stuff out of the corner of my eye. So it was pretty eventful even before you got there. Yeah, because you did a live. And, yes, I did. Uh, yeah, you did a live before we got there. Yeah, I hit... Um there was a tractor trailer accident and they had the complete interstate block. So they took me on some really neat uh, motorcycle back roads. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, but, uh, but yeah, um, normally I like to get there early because I'm like you, I like to get there and really be centered and calm when I right. go into these locations. Um, it was my first time. Uh, and I know you said some, you had really great things to say about this place. This is one that had been on my bucket list just because of the unique story that surrounds it as well as some of the different stories that other investigators had had from there. And I know when I got there, it's like, okay, got to get out and knock, knock the B-roll out while there's daylight. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for, um, for me, as soon as I got out, started filming, my gimbal died. And yep. I was going to show that, but I think it's some pretty good blooper footage that I'm going to say <laughs> for, uh, for that. Cause I was so frustrated. It, it started the investigation off on a, on a weird foot for me because it's like my gimbal's not working. And then as soon as we go in and start setting things up, everything was just failing. All, yeah. all, I mean, all the equipment, um, I had, I had five static cameras that I set mm -hmm. up and out of the five static or no, I'm sorry, six, I had six on this investigation and out of the six, I had um, only had three of them that worked. So I'm convinced that we would have caught some really interesting things during that session um, in the seance room. Yeah. Had that camera not failed. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you had, the entire seance room covered. You had mm -hmm. the, um, if you remember in the episode for those watching, on the SLS, you had a little figure huddled in the corner. You mm -hmm. had the static cam up on, I believe, the mantle. Yes. And so that would have, if it's crouched behind something, that would have had, you know, a top-down view of whatever it was. And so mm -hmm. that would have been the perfect angle. And then the doorway that was behind me, where we kept hearing something walk back and forth, you would have had that angle. Because I believe, I can't remember the kind of camera that your static cam is, but it has a wide angle lens. Yes. And it's very short, you know, millimeter, probably like between mm -hmm. 8 to 18. So it would have had that entire area captured. Um, and it just, yeah. it really sucks that it just didn't <laughs> work. Especially when the thing ran by us, when uh, it came out of the room and it blocked out mm -hmm. the laser grid. Because I got that on my camera. You can actually see the, you know, the shadow move across. And I was, you know, so nice. excited to see what the you know, what your X cam got. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I had, um, like you said, I had those and the other one that failed was in that, in that drapery room or the exorcist room. Mm -hmm. And we were getting some really interesting activity in there while we were in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, uh, so I had those cameras fail. Those cameras have audio, but I do leave an audio recorder as well. Right. And I had to keep checking because every time I would go in, a recorder would be off mm -hmm. and it would either not record or it would shut off. And right. so, uh, so I was really concerned that I didn't, I wasn't able to capture very much. Um, mm -hmm. So I was constantly plugging in cameras and plugging in equipment the whole time, but let's, let's kind of step back from the beginning and um, talk about, so the typical investigation there at the Nickerson Sneed house doesn't that typically start with a seance uh, and an yes. introduction? Typically, when you investigate in the Nickerson Sneed house, Rhonda Caudill, the owner of the place, she gives you a walk around tour of the place and she introduces you to the spirits. Basically saying, hey, this is, you know, Miranda from Ghost Biker Exploration. She's here to investigate. She's not going to hurt you. She's a friend. That kind of stuff. Um and then we, you know, do the tour, come back down, get our equipment, and then we'll go to the seance room and just basically do a seance. And it's more of like, you know, acclimating the house's energy, the spirit's energy with your energy. And it's also acclimating your personal energy and senses to, you know, speaking to the other side. 
you know, I believe that there is, you know, call it, you know, for lack of a better term, like a warm up period when you're getting adjusted to, you know, opening up all of your senses, including your sixth sense. And that's part of what that sounds is to do. And I remember one of my first, first times there, I asked her, I said, well, what if we don't want to do a seance? Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly her telling me it's usually not good. You know, spirits get a little pissed off. And, you know, I don't remember why we didn't do a seance. I think they were in a hurry. We were in a hurry. Because, um, you know, yeah. our, our stuff was messing up. We were losing time. We wanted to just kind of, you know, get on with it. So, you uh -huh. know, we were off to a bad start. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, too, part of it, uh, I think she was flying in from somewhere. She was mm -hmm. out of town. And so uh, you and I talked extensively about this um, by just how different the activity was from what you had experienced on other investigations there. Mm -hmm. um, could have possibly come from if they have a tradition of how they start investigations and how they introduce all of a right. sudden at this house. Now you have two people that... Um, they're, they don't know coming into their space mm -hmm. and they didn't have their introduction, if you will. Right. I mean, it could be seen as disrespectful, you know, which that wasn't our intent for those of yeah. you watching. But, you know, from from the spirit's perspective, you know, I can see where they might, you know, kind of view it that way, especially with all the batteries and stuff that we had. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's more than enough energy sources for them to drain. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so, so we didn't start off with that and we started yeah. off with the intense drain and, mm -hmm. um, essentially, so if, if I'm not mistaken, let's talk a little bit about your episode because there was something in yours that I thought was really interesting that I didn't cover. Um, and it was, um, some of the photography that you took there and mm -hmm. something we had captured there in the seance room. Yeah. Are you talking about the, uh, the eyes? Yeah. So that was when we were going to film our B-roll and stuff, like nighttime B-roll. And I just happened to be walking. I think you were walking in front of me, and I just happened to see a really cool angle. And I took a photo, and they're just like these two little silverish eyes. And I think when we were looking at the size, it would be like that of a child, you know, maybe mm -hmm. like four and a half foot tall, something like that, almost five foot tall. Um, I haven't been back to the house to try and debunk it. I would mm -hmm. like to go back to see if I could um, because I, you know, enhanced it on Photoshop, Lightroom. I've done mm -hmm. everything I know what to do to it. Um, I, I have not been able to debunk it yet because I took about five or six photos from the same angle with flash, without flash, and mm -hmm. we were not able to replicate those eyes. I think you even took one, if I'm not mistaken, I think you, I even went over there and stood mm -hmm. where it was, where it would be. And I think you even mm -hmm. snapped a picture then just to see where it would hit. Yeah. Um, and what's so, also interesting is I was recording B-roll right before I took the photo because okay. I was doing like, you know, from the side kitchen, I was doing like a side view. And then I thought, hey, this would be a really cool with like the red drapes, and, you know, the darkness. I wanted, I thought it looked beautiful. So I stopped the recording, took a photo, continued recording. And then when I went back and looked at the photo, that's when I noticed it. it exactly. Because as we were standing there, you reviewed your B-roll footage. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, Dee Dee asks here, she said, uh, love that. She said, will we see the photo? You, you have that in your episode, don't you? I Did do you have that? that in my episode. I do also have it uh, on my computer somewhere with, you know, the other 20,000 photos I've taken. <laughs> but I, I will definitely send it to Miranda and she can share it um, on her page once I find it. Yeah, and I actually have, because I was looking at the footage, um, because I was also filming B-roll at that point from mm -hmm. behind you and filming you taking pictures. And uh, I have a shot over your shoulder where we're looking at it and recreating it. Yeah. Um, and of course, obviously things look, look different when you have essentially a video of a small screen like that. Right. You can clearly see it. And um, it was Oh yeah, they're eyes. They yeah. are eyes. And what's weird is, you know, there's something kind of like when you see them, you get like a weird feeling inside. And, you know, sometimes people say when you get a feeling like that, that's your sense of telling you, hey, this is genuine. You should probably watch out for it. Mm -hmm. And so, Absolutely. you know, I'm not I'm not going to call it paranormal simply because I haven't been back there to try and debunk it. Uh, but it is very, very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and and that was kind of the feel of the whole night um mm -hmm. you know so so let's talk a little bit about the house you know because the house itself is strange it is and if we could backtrack just a little bit mm -hmm. this has been my third trip here and so i thought i knew the nickerson sneed house pretty well um and you know it's it's an active place it is a very active location but it's like, you know, you're run of the mill stuff. You see shadow figures out of the corner of your eye. You'll hear stuff in the other room. You'll get spirit box stuff. You know, occasionally there'll be like a, wow, that's creepy kind of thing happen. But, you know, it's like, it's like once every two or three hours over the course mm -hmm. of an investigation. And I believe it was three or four, because we investigate on a Tuesday, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. The Saturday before that is when I had gotten back from Greensboro because I was filming and releasing my Ghost of Gifford Courthouse That's documentary. Right. And I had been going at it for like 10 days straight, you know, working hours and hours, traveling back and forth, you know, three hours, you know, four days a week. And so I was basically like burned out, spent at this point. And so my original plan going into our investigation was, you know, this is just to be a laid back investigation. <laughs> I, I knew this was your first time here. You wanted to film. So, you know, I think I even told you, you know, I just want to film for you tonight. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm going to take it easy, that kind of thing. And that's why, you know, a lot of the footage from my episode starts about, I don't know what, 10 or 11 p.m. Because I really yeah. was not filming the investigation. And then, you know, it took a turn. And it was a turn that, you know, I had never seen the house take before. Because, you know, people have died in the house. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the stuff with Dr. Nickerson, there could be negative energy attached to his practice. We don't know because there's a lot of, you know, historical inaccuracies and mysteries in terms of, you know, what exactly he did there. Um, not a but, lot of information. Either. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which is really suspicious. But, uh, you know, <laughs> and then there's the uh, Cherokee Indian Native American stuff nearby. It didn't take place at the house, but it was close enough to where you can almost say it affects the general area. And so, that was fascinating to me, yeah, uh, for the most part, about just how much Native American activity, because it was their meeting spot. Mm -hmm. And so to see the house take, you know, that drastic turn that it did, you know, that's when all of a sudden I switched from, you know, kind of chill, lay back to, okay, this is getting serious. And, you know, I, I switched it on, you know, got all my equipment out, was doing my filming. And in a weird way, it just got worse and worse and worse as the night went on. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it's almost comedic when you think about it. But it's time, I remember you and I were talking about leaving the house for a few minutes. Because mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was getting that rough. Especially when we heard the thing come out of the kid's room. That was, that's in the top five most disturbing experiences in my paranormal career. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so that was a thing. So one thing, you know, I, I said this during while we were talking, um, I said that or while yesterday, while we were talking in the, in the chat room, you know, this house, unfortunately, does get some noise pollution because mm -hmm. it is just off of I-81. And so um, you had prepared me for that, you mm -hmm. know, with it being uh, it's like, OK, we may have to do some different things considering this is this may have some noise pollution. And so, um, you know, when we went in and we were sitting there really just, I mean, we'd been doing a session in the kids room. Mm. I think we had been in there maybe 20 to 30 minutes and we were having dramatic temperature drop. Like I'd never seen, I mean, it literally yeah. dropped 10 degrees in like a 15 minute period. Right. And, um, it was in March when we had had gone and filmed. And so it was cooler, but it, it wasn't really cold. I mean, it yeah. was pretty comfortable. And there shouldn't have been fluctuations like that. Not like that. No. Yeah. And so just having that conversation up there and talking about, I think we were talking about like St. Albans and talking about just how some mm -hmm. different places affect, you know, we'd been actively investigating as to asking questions, but then started a conversation. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I thought someone had come in on us. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. And, you know, the kid's room is one of the creepiest rooms for me because it has that stupid clown painting right behind me. And it's got the dolls hanging around, you know, and then the, you know, the elemental that's supposed to be like hiding under mm -hmm. the bed, you know. So it's it's a room that you're already kind of on edge about. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. It did feel like something, you know, entered, you know, our area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I wasn't able to show, I, I was listening with my headphones in real time. And so I could hear stuff 
in real time. I could all I could hear the traffic noise outside and I could hear that. And it was it when you have those headphones on on your recorder and listening in real time, it really amplifies things. Yeah. And uh, and sometimes it can get to be so much sound that it's hard to distinguish between. But mm -hmm. um, we were hearing we heard a screech and then we heard like two female moans and I wasn't able to to pull those sounds off the recorder. Um, we heard it. One of them you could kind of hear, but they just weren't loud enough because um, yeah. we did hear them with our ears. And so I wasn't able to pull those. But before all that happened, we were hearing really loud, audible sounds. Yeah. And then that crash. Yeah. Well, if you go back and watch your episode, you can see your face go from like normal listening to like, oh, my God, what is that? <laughs> In like <laughs> half a second. And that was, I think, when we heard like the it sounded like a screech. But when I listened to it on, you know, the premiere last night, it almost sounded like something was at that back door by the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That's kind yeah. of, which is weird because some the almost the same exact thing happened to my dad and I when we were there, you know, the previous time. We heard almost that same exact sound. But those female moments, I mean, I've never heard anything that clear in my life. No, no. And so just to kind of set up how that room is. So that room is in the front of the house on the mm -hmm. second floor. And it's just across the hall from Betsy Sneed's room. And this room was believed to be um, to be a nursery at at that time correct in a kid's room maybe mm -hmm. during the uh mason family when they owned mm -hmm. it okay i believe and, so yeah and so uh, some of the different reports in that room um if if you watch the episode you see we were asking about something being under the bed um some of the different reports that other investigators have gotten there and jake mentioned it a minute ago is that there is supposedly an elemental that um has been seen if you're sitting in the hall um, you can see an arm or see um, see just some kind of crazy thing, if you will, um, inside that room. And so what was interesting to me was when we started hearing that sound, it was when the temperature had dropped to obviously that magic number. And yeah. you were, I thought it was interesting because I couldn't remember where it happened at. And when you said, you know, if you brought this, the temperature down to this degree, you're going to need to make a really loud noise. And it did. Not it just did. one, but like three or four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, Cody has an interesting question. He said, do you think it could have been reacting to Miranda's energy being it was her first time there? That's a really good question. Um, it, it's tough to answer because this is the first time I've investigated with Miranda. So mm -hmm. I don't really know how spirits, you know, adjust to her energy on other investigations i think it's definitely possible mm -hmm. um you know i would have to investigate with miranda again to kind of see if you know if for some reason spirits just like you more they don't like you more <laughs> <laughs> i mean there are definitely some locations where i am not welcome <laughs> i i can understand that you know i, I typically you know i typically have a, a fair amount of activity um if i've got or at least unexplained things happening Mm -hmm. when I go. Um, but there's been a few places I've gone to that they let you know right quick that uh, they don't want to talk to you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I never felt unwelcome there. Um, well, okay. Okay. <laughs> During the seance when, you know, something ran by us, I felt something like grab, was it, I had my leg grabbed in the bottom at you the, did. uh, Sandra, and then you felt something touch your leg upstairs before yes. that. Yes. So uh, when, when it started getting handsy, and then do you remember yeah. when we were asking about Francis King? I think it's in my episode, but we started seeing shadow figures like darting, yes. you know, circular as if it was surrounding us. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, you know, something was like threatening us. Something said it would gut me, which I think is <laughs> the funniest thing of all time. That was the time when, um, you know, I felt like we should probably leave for our safety because I yeah. didn't feel welcome. I felt like something was extremely pissed. Mm -hmm. And there were times where, you know, you really don't want to say it was inhuman, but there yeah. were times where it didn't feel human. It felt, which, you know, mm -hmm. you could almost say that's like a collective energy because if you have a bunch of angry spirits, 
you know, mm -hmm. just collecting their energy and directing it into an area. I think sometimes that can be mistaken for a more powerful entity. And so, mm -hmm. you know, going back, I think that's more than likely what was happening than it being, you know, some, you know, demon or diabolical force. I think it was just yeah. a bunch of angry people, you know, directing their energy at us. <laughs> I think that's what it was. And, and that's a very good explanation because, um, you know, I'm, I'm not someone to go negative, um, yeah. you know, and I do, I do enjoy investigating those locations from time to time just to see if what the, you know, what other people are getting if I have the same type of activity, because I'm, I'm a firm believer, you never know what you're going to find when you're out there. But the right. majority of the time, it's, it's maybe more aggressive than mm -hmm. the negative but you do come across it and and yeah. just like people they get moody you know? yeah they do you know? and uh so um so yeah i mean I, that's kind of my thinking on it is that you know I, it very well could have been a collective because mm -hmm. there were a lot of spirits in that house yeah. and the the spirit box session so so we ended up doing if i'm not mistaken i think we did like four sessions um i think it was I can remember three off the top of my head. I think we did do one last one. We did one where we sort of essentially walked around and mm -hmm. then we did, um, we did two different ones in the seance room kind of back to back. And that was yeah. when things got, got really um, crazy. Well, remember then, the K2, the K2 disappeared. Yes. yes. Now that's I not was, unlike anything I've ever experienced. I was wondering if, you know, you had extra footage of that because I need to go back because um, so so what we're talking about here and uh, and I'll, I'll definitely I see a bunch of, of questions over here. So I'll definitely um, hit on those here in just a second. Um, so essentially, you know, we did these different different um, K2 sessions because we knew that we we might not be able to pick up a lot of EVPs. So we were doing, uh, excuse me, different uh, spirit box sessions. So inside the seance room, um, we ended up, I, I, again, I had that camera that didn't work. You had your camera going. I had mine. And I'm trying to remember if this was after we played K2 Hide and Seek. It was after. Okay. So we did K2 Hide and Seek and we had two K2 meters. I think like what I had one sitting there. Yeah, you had one on in front of you and then I had the one on the board. Yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm trying to remember. It went dark, didn't it? We we ended up going completely dark. Mm hmm Well, it's and, because they kept making it dance back and forth. And so, you know, I think yeah. our thought was they wanted it dark. So, you uh, know, we just doused everything. I think that's, yeah. I know we went dark and, and we're sitting there watching the laser grid and stuff. And the K2 meter, th it sounds weird to even say it, but the K2 meter disappeared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just it's gone just you know vanished thin air yeah and we ended up finding it back at base camp with yeah. your stuff that was the deal yeah. it was on top of like your um like camera bags and stuff like that mm -hmm. which that entire night i never went anywhere near your stuff the entire night and it was just sitting <laughs> right on top of everything else <laughs> well and too we hadn't we hadn't even been in there yeah it was there we went mm -hmm. dark and then it was gone and mm -hmm. now we did investigate we investigated from you know you were from six that e or five something that evening uh i was a little closer to seven we investigated until seven o'clock that next morning or eight o'clock I and mean, we didn't even stop <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, and you actually left before. I, I didn't leave the house till almost yeah. 9.30 the next morning. That's right, because I had a meeting three and a half hours away and no mm -hmm. no sleep. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it was just, um, I don't think I've ever been that drained at an investigation before. Yeah, I mean, that was, we were running on pure adrenaline. <laughs> mm -hmm. We did the last spear box session, I think at like 530 in the morning, you could see like the sun coming up, the birds <laughs> were out and it was, it was a very strange feeling, you know, and to investigate for basically 12 hours straight. But you know, it wasn't like, you know, we were forcing an investigation mm -hmm. stuff kept happening. Yeah. And yeah, you know, even never... when I was about to leave, I was still hearing stuff going on. 
Yeah, we we never left the house because at one point we did talk mm -hmm. about stepping outside, letting everything kind of settle down. Yeah. But when we decided we were going to do that, things started happening all around us because and, and mm -hmm. that's what was going on when I was showing. And I think there was even a little bit more when I was showing that upstairs session, um, you know, because so essentially like i said I, I set the cameras up we just kind of left the static cameras to run mm -hmm. and um you know it was interesting to me because i'm trying to think you know we got the name tommy and thomas a couple mm -hmm. times yeah. um it repeated us when we were saying thomas and then we asked i think we were up in the doctor's room we asked what is your skeleton's name mm -hmm. and it and, said tommy yeah as clear yeah. as can be that was um, cool. Yeah, exactly. And so, so we did a couple different sessions there, but I was really, um, I was really impressed because sitting and watching, you know, uh, Dee Dee mentions here, that's a lot to review for 12 hours. And <laughs> it, it is. is when you have, in my case, at that point, it was three cameras, um, three static cameras to review for, for 12 hours and uh, five different audio recorders. Um, but when we're sitting there, it, the whole thing was completely quiet upstairs, yeah. except for a few flashes of the flashlight. Yeah. We did have a few times of that. The laser grid ended up dying, which, mm -hmm. um, the battery that I had the laser grid on it, I mean, it typically lasts, I mean, it's a big battery. So it typically mm -hmm. lasts at least six or eight hours if it's fully charged. Um, right. so that one died and again, like I said, it was kind of quiet with the flashlight, but that REM pod had been sitting there quiet up until we did that final um, session there in the seance room. Mm -hmm. And it, it was interesting to me because when you started asking about the doctor and sort of sort of questioning his reputation. A little yeah, bit, I was basically calling him out. <laughs> yeah. It that's when it started going. And I thought, oh, the REM pod's dying was what I first started to think. Mm -hmm. But you know, when a REM pod starts to die, you get that constant scream that sounds like a siren at that right. point, and then it just dies out. But yeah, something instead, was setting it off. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. it was interesting that it was setting the, the flashlight and the REM pod was setting off at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, or at least simultaneously. And I had hoped that you know, when I put it, put that in there that you could hear our questions because we were asking questions about, we were hearing stuff upstairs, which yeah. was interesting. We were hearing stuff upstairs. We were seeing shadows around us. Mm -hmm. And then um, we were asking about coming out of that room and when it, it would did. come out of that room, yeah, the flashlight would light up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I think on my episode, you can actually hear, cause I amplify the audio. You can hear the footsteps of something walking out. Yes. Of that room, which, which was really room. creepy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, I'm going to look over here in the comments. I was and, say, we've got all sorts of uh, great questions here. Yeah, yeah. You know, Nancy, that that may be the case. Uh, I know that that was in, in mention to uh, talking about my energy. I do try to be calm in these mm -hmm. places. Um, so sometimes I feel like that that may play a role in it. Mm -hmm. um, and Cody says, uh, you mentioned a doctor. Do y'all know who his victims were, more female or male? There is not a lot of information there, unfortunately. Um, from what I've been able to gather, he was kind of like, you know, a country doctor. He did a mix of everything. Um, as for how qualified he was to do all of this stuff, you know, I don't really know. Uh, there aren't really any death records to say, you know, this mm -hmm. patient died here. You know, how many it almost sounds bad to say what the death toll was. It makes it sound really bad, but we really don't know. Um, I assume during the civil war, a lot of the soldiers that were, you know, in care there, they unfortunately passed away. So, you know, there, there was death at the hands of not just him, mm -hmm. but I'm sure the other doctors and nurses that were, you know, working there and stuff like that, especially during the civil war. I mean, yeah. there, there are stories that the morgue, which is the basement area, that it was impossible to walk in because the bodies were stacked from floor to ceiling all over the place. So you're looking at easily like, you know, probably at least a hundred, maybe even yeah. more bodies just in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
um, and that basement was interesting and mm -hmm. I'll be covering a more, a little more on that later, but cause we didn't really spend much time no. down there. No. Um, and so, so, I mean, I'm six feet tall and the basement is not, but about that much taller than I am. Yeah. And what's so cool about it are those boards from the, the 1700s. Old logs. Yeah. yeah. 1745 yeah. when Francis King Cannon cut them down. One of the yeah. coolest things in the world. Yeah, and if you believe that, which I tend to think, you know, especially with residual energy and such, that trees and, and everything can kind of absorb that, mm -hmm. um, I think that that makes a great conductor on that that bottom right yeah. there. Because if you've got all these bodies stacked from floor to ceiling under this wood frame. It's going to soak could, it up. Exactly. And you yeah. could look and you could see just the wear and tear of it. I mean, it was, it was quite, quite amazing. And again, it just, is. just the way that the house was built around the cabin is just kind of mind blowing to me. Well, it's, it's a feat of, you know, you know, just sound structure that they were able to just mm -hmm. build this house around this original two room cabin. Yeah. You know, the cabin was a fort during the French and Indian war. Um, it was a fort during the Revolutionary War. Um, Virginia militia on their way to the Battle of Kings Mountain and Guilford Courthouse, they stopped there for supplies. And uh, the road that's right in front of the house was the road that they walked on. So, you know, soldiers and stuff walked all over that place. And, you know, I've read stories that there were skirmishes with uh, Native Americans and nearby. I don't know how close, but I had heard stories that there was sporadic fighting. So... Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of history that those logs could have soaked up. Exactly. And uh, that brings me to Glenn's question. He says, so the house was used for a hospital during the Civil War. Yes. Yes, it was. Do you know if he was a, a Union or Southern sympathizer? I honestly, I say? do not. I do not remember. I mean, naturally being in the South um, and the fact that they did have, you know, slaves and stuff, I would assume he was a bit more Southern. Uh, which makes you wonder, you know, was he willing to help the Union soldiers? Because it was mostly Union soldiers that were at the hospital. And so, you know, not to assume which side he chose, but if he was a Southern mm -hmm. sympathizer and he's forced to care for Union soldiers, I mean, how good is that care going to be? Right. You know, that's right. really because this is talking about, you know, after the Battle of Saltville, uh, some of these campaigns when the Union had effectively run the Confederate soldiers and army out of that area. And they didn't really use total war tactics, but there was a scorched really earth. Like yeah, it was that. And it was also scorched earth to a lesser degree than what Sherman used during his march to the sea because Saltville was extremely important to the Confederate cause. And so when the Union came through that, they wanted to strip all useful supplies and destroy the railroads. And that included going to different houses, farms, commandeering animals, um, you know, the livestock, pets, crops, and just, you know, stealing it, destroying it and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, because from from what I had read, I mean, there was a lot of um, guerrilla warfare going on at that point and actually mm -hmm. um what I think one of the Southern generals there after that campaign was, was hung for um, he was killing black union soldiers. Correct. Yep. I can't uh, remember his okay. name, but that was, that was commonplace during, you know, during the, and it's commonplace during all wars, you know, guerrilla warfare is a very mm -hmm. dirty thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to see some of the most messed up stuff you'll ever hear in your life, look at the guerrilla fighting in South Carolina during the revolution. I yeah. mean, a lot of those people would be considered serial killers today, the stuff that happens. And so you, know, you have a house that not just has the original logs from 1745, but you have a family and a community that is, you know, literally front and center, you know, mm -hmm. getting the wounded and the dead into this place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all that energy from not just the battle, the people, the campaigns. It's all in one house. Mm hmm. And uh, and I totally agree with uh, Janet's comment. That's, Thank you, that's Janet. why I really enjoyed investigating with you on this one. Um, Jimmy says, when both of you were touched, did it feel cold touch or was it uh, phonically touch? Phonically or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> words are hard. <laughs> <laughs> right. But good question, Jimmy. When I was touched, I remember it felt like icy fingers. 
around me is kind of what it felt like. I know for me, because um, I didn't show it, but when we were sitting there in the kids' room, um, something kind of touched under my leg. I was sitting on the floor. To mm. me, this is, it, it's so weird to explain this way, but, uh, and he says on here, physically touched. <laughs> um, it, to me, it felt like, like when you walk through a spider web, you know, yeah. it, it felt like I had gotten a spider web around my leg and it was kind of mm. like, like tickling my leg or whatever. Yeah. Um, Which is really weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was when I know we started getting concerned because usually when spirits start getting handsy with you, mm -hmm. it's usually a bad sign because in order for spirits to do that, you know, according to my beliefs, they have to have a lot mm -hmm. of energy to do mm -hmm. that. Not just once, like doing it once would be amazing. Yeah. But doing it like three or four times, you know, that's when you start getting really suspicious. You're like, you know, that's when I remember you and I had a discussion of, you know, something's going on here that, you know, we're not aware of, you know, should we step out and let the house recharge? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. because I've never seen anything like that before. Because there are my times I have been scratched. I've been hit. You know, I've been grabbed by stuff before. But that's usually like isolated incidents. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it'll happen once and then won't happen again rest of the night you know this is us you know you feel in that sensation something grabbing my leg uh feeling something on the back of your neck it's just one after another and it's not normal exactly exactly uh glenn says um so have there been any sightings or evps from former civil war soldiers at the house or on the grounds off the top of my head, um, I do remember a story where some people would see um, Civil War soldiers in the basement and around the back part of the house, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been historically accurate because obviously Civil War soldiers were buried, uh, not buried, but they were housed in the basement mm -hmm. until the ground was warm enough to bury them. And mm -hmm. then when they would have moved the bodies either from the basement to the carriages or from the carriages to the basement, they actually would have used like it's like a it's like a storm cellar door. Yeah. That's what they would have used. And it's actually still there. So, you know, seeing spirits around that old door is, you know, historically accurate. Um, unfortunately, I've never had any experience with Civil War soldiers there, but I have heard people talk about seeing and hearing Civil War soldiers there. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I know um, uh, I know you were talking about uh, how they would would take them, you know, with uh, ho uh, black horses on a black horse drawn carriage. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what I thought was interesting about it was when we started asking civil wars about civil war soldiers and we got that on the spirit box, uh, where it said, um, happened and dirt. Yeah. And I thought that was that, I thought that was interesting. You know, for me, the, the spirit box voices at that location, uh, you know, I've only ever had, two other locations that have had so many voices and that were so they sounded so much different than yeah. what you typically get on the spirit box um you know Rev, when i was at revenant acres i had a really really intense uh spirit box session uh, saying some really vulgar and crass things mm -hmm. and you could hear it i mean it it was coming from the spirit box obviously right. for some reason some of the voices that we were capturing didn't I mean it just didn't sound like the typical like sort of um, mechanical voices and stuff that you get on that like the kids voice we got that weird woman's voice I could never make out what she was saying mm -hmm. and like the creepy whisper you know or the metallic like, scratchy voice yes that very, was the darkest one yes whenever it would come across but I, I totally agree with you i've never heard anything like that before my that clear yeah. um which you know kind of leads back to the theory we had that you know something was supercharging the location that night mm -hmm. and you know yeah. i remember we were talking about the night of um because one of the things we did if you remember to see if the house would calm down mm -hmm. is we actually took like an hour uh break I yes. remember we were sitting there, we were eating our snacks. We were talking about, you know, stuff, nothing to do with the house. And we agree that, you know, it was like one of those one in a million nights that just, you know, everything just happened to like, you know, the stars align, it's an eclipse, <laughs> you know, the limestone decided to supercharge itself. 
but I've never seen the house like that before. And the only time I've ever seen anything kind of rival that was uh, May 13th at St. Albans, which that was, that was awful. I'm getting flashbacks to that I now. Say, but... I think you had a interesting, uh, which is funny you say that because I'm wearing my St. Albans. I noticed. I was, I was about to say something. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing my St. Albans hoodie. Um, yeah, no, it, I remember you talking about that one. And, and that's what I like about you, though, too, and, and why I really enjoyed being able to collaborate with you is because I really like your historical approach and the mm -hmm. approach where you go in. So you don't focus on, on the dark. The dark happens. It um, does. And it's interesting, and you handle it very well. Um, Appreciate it. And uh, absolutely. And so I really like that because that you do handle it with that historical approach. And uh, I, I absolutely had a blast investigating with you there. Um, what was probably one of your favorite, most memorable parts of it? Oh, goodness. Um, first of all, it was a blast investigating with you, too. I remember we had met at Phantom Fest a few yes. years back. 2019, I think, is when that was. Mm -hmm. And we had always talked about, you know, doing an investigation together. And so to finally mm -hmm. investigate, it was awesome. especially a location like that. You know, it's one of my favorite places to go. Um, probably the most memorable moment for me was the entire seance spirit box session, that first part. Um, yeah. when things were like kind of normal and then it got worse and worse and it just kept getting worse. And, you know, there, when you're investigating, it's very important, you know, everyone listening, listen closely. You can't control your external surroundings or your external people, but you can control yourself to an extent. You know, if mm -hmm. you get out of control on an investigation, mm -hmm. you know, you need to stop right there. You know, yeah. you can get hurt. Someone can get hurt. You can accidentally, you know, break something, you know, just nothing good ever comes from it. And so if you ever get to the point to where you feel like you're out of control or you even see someone that looks, you know, out of control, you know, something like that, you need to say something, you need to stop. Mm -hmm. And this was one of those investigations where it felt like things got out of control. And, you know, I, I have all sorts of things that I do, you know, to try and ground myself, protect myself, mm -hmm. and then kind of regain control. And mm -hmm. everything I was trying was not working. And so, you know, that was the point. I've never done this in my 12 years. You know, I asked you, I said, do we need to step out of the house? Yeah. I mean, I've never done that before. And so that's the most memorable moment for me because, you know, it was, it was disturbing. It was sudden, mm -hmm. but it's a great teaching moment. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that um, because we did talk about that and it wasn't that we weren't willing to step away by no right. means. Um, and I'm trying to think of the circumstance. It's almost like because that was at the point when it was saying it was going to gut you. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was um, saying vulgar stuff to both of us. And then I don't it wasn't in your episode. I think it might have been in part of mine. But you started getting SLS hits, and then we were seeing stuff in the laser grid right behind you by the piano. And yes, and you I were think, hearing stuff behind you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I didn't, because I didn't have any footage of that on mm -hmm. my mobile camera that was with me. So I, I need to get with you uh, if you've got that footage, mm -hmm. um, because my static camera behind me obviously at that time wasn't working right. and my mobile camera um, that I had sitting there focusing wasn't working either. Um, but yeah, at that point uh, we were getting hits on the SLS and mm -hmm. uh, uh, things were occurring behind me. And so um, I got and it. And it was at that point I got to where I couldn't stay awake. Like I was mm -hmm. sitting there talking and I felt like I was just, I didn't even care. I was just yeah. going to just lay my head down on the table and go to sleep. I was so <laughs> tired <laughs> and so drained. And normally I'm, I'm not um, like that. I had had, you know, mm -hmm. a few busy days leading up to it. But normally when you're on that adrenaline from an investigation, yeah. it's, you know, step away, get a bite to eat, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in the break room, that sort of thing, kind of chill and go back. But even when we did that, um, it, it didn't help. No, know, and it, it was weird because, you know, 
you are the only one that the location seemed to be kind of like targeting, you know, mm -hmm. your batteries and equipment were messing up. You were feeling physical effects, mm -hmm. you know, cause you know, not, not to be mean, but I felt perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, I was in the zone, I was locked in and I remember seeing, I was like, I was like, she is being affected by something. And then you're it started getting, years, you're also I was about to say, younger than me. <laughs> but it was, you know, it, it felt like, you know, it was getting worse because it was like closing in on us. Yeah. Because my point where I was ready to tap out was when you saw the thing on the SLS in the mm -hmm. corner and we started seeing the dots move around and mm -hmm. it was like, that doesn't look right. You know, cause we were seeing like, I think you described like a little beach ball size thing is what we were seeing move around. Wow. And then I saw something in the doorway and I remember playing as they just looking over and seeing like this black shape, just like move from that room run by my leg, mm -hmm. literally from like, you know, me to, you know, my wall, which was like three feet. And then it mm -hmm. went by me and I could feel the wind and to see something like that with my own eyes and, you know, to see the laser grid in front of me go out, it, I got it on my camera too. That was the most like, okay, it's getting that brazen. You know, yeah. I, that was my moment. And it was, and now that you mentioned it, because I had, um, I had kind of, that slipped my mind, I guess, when I was in my tired state, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was very small, whatever mm -hmm. it was we were seeing. And, um, you know, a lot of the time on the SLS, obviously things will take on that human form. I've only right. ever had, I've only ever had something happen like that at Brushy Mountain Prison where Christy, and, and it's, it's interesting. So what I need to do is I need to see, look again, just to make sure that I don't have that footage. Mm -hmm. We saw something that looked like, I mean, it was tiny. It just looked like a little mound, maybe about mm -hmm. this big, materialized. And she saw it with her eye. I saw it on my SLS. And um, my camera guy had had it on the camera. He just happened to have the camera focused mm -hmm. between us. And so we actually captured it, which is which is kind of a cool trifecta capture, I guess. I but it, and it just doesn't happen very often. But it mm -hmm. was a very, very small kind of beach ball shape. Um, you know, like like you just said, it, it didn't take the shape of a human. It took the no. shape of like a little it was like a like thing. a ball of energy. That's the that's yeah. the only way I've ever called it. It's just, you know, it's it's a form of energy. Yeah. Or it could have been something crawling. Which is really disturbing. Yeah, because <laughs> that reminds me, we were reading um, Rhonda's book, and I remember seeing something that someone had reported, like a little crawler type thing. And uh -huh. They <laughs> reported a crawler? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah I reported, remember I was looking at that. <laughs> and, and I made sure not to read about all the different experiences that people were having too in-depth until um, after my investigation. Mm -hmm. um, but she, you know, she told us because literally she was only there for a few minutes yeah. just to essentially come and say hi to us. Um, and she was talking about one of the things that people had seen was like, because they do a haunted house in there during mm -hmm. the, uh, um, during the spooky season. So, so uh, let me just digress for a minute. We had, you know, the house is a museum. Um mm -hmm. And I think they they aren't open a whole lot now with with COVID, but the house is a museum. It's uh, open for paranormal investigations, and um, it's also a, um, a haunted attraction during haunt season. And so one of the stories was some of the people was seeing either someone that was very small, almost like a little person there in the exorcist room that when they would come around the ex the little person would like grab mm -hmm. them by the hand and walk with them yeah and so um it's interesting that um she had said that the person had said you know it was creepy in the haunted house especially when you know the little person came up to me yeah. and uh so there have been reports of like you said of a of a crawler and then also of a very small person in there and then also there's um in that hallway the upstairs hallway and then by the exorcist room there's the uh, the button eyes the thing that was mimicking what the one girl is dressed up as that's and right. that's supposed to be the short looking figure too okay do, yeah. do people believe that's the elemental 
I think some people think it is because um, when we were first there um, for no, the second time we were there, we filmed our very first investigation episode there, the five files. And we interviewed three people that had experiences there. And one of the girls, I can't remember her name. She's very nice, but she was actually the one that was dressed up as okay. the button eyes. And she was in the exorcist room about four or five years ago. And they got the sense that it wasn't, you know, the elemental force, but they thought it was almost like, um, like a doppelganger or like a mimicker. That's kind of what they thought it was. It was something completely separate. I've heard, I've heard that there is a uh, dop that there are doppelganger activity. Uh, Excuse me, I can't even talk. That there is (laughs) doppelganger. There are doppelganger activity. There's doppelganger activity inside of that location. No, and then Janet brings up. I believe a full moon makes yes. an impact on lots of things. I definitely agree. Um, I can't remember if it was a full moon when we were there or not. Uh, I actually noted that it was. Um, I believe it was a waxing crescent. Ah. Um, I always note that in the start of my videos, um, just because, and I note the inside temperature, outside, and the weather. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't remember if it was a waxing or a waning moon, mm-hmm. but. I did put that in the start of the episode and I have noticed it's really interesting. Um, for some reason, I tend to investigate when there's a waxing or waning moon more so than a full moon, not always, right. but more so. And I have found that um, I believe it's the waning moon ten, for me has, has a lot of really interesting activity. Now mm-hmm. I've not, I would like to, um, I need to double check and see what the moon is when I went back to this location. Yeah. Because let me just say the activity was different when we, uh, when I went back for my second investigation there. And, uh, but Janet is very much right. Um, My, uh, my grandmother and and grandfather had dementia and my sister is a physical therapist in a uh, nursing home and she talks about how it, I mean, it totally affects animals. It totally Mm -hmm. affects the people in the, in the patients in the nursing home. Um, So why would it not affect spirits? Yeah. I mean, they were people too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. Jimmy says, I've heard that like that before where a chick came out of someone's body during uh, body after death during a funeral and come out to find out that person was a witch doctor in his village. Interesting. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, and thank you, Nancy. Yeah, definitely great comments, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, and interesting stories on the house. Um, you know, what, and, and something that I'll definitely, uh, you know, hit on since this was hit on yesterday, um, you know, we, we, um, we did get, and I know a lot of people have strong feelings about uh, Ouija boards and such. Um, <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, because n- neither of us have that in our in our tools. No, no, I, I don't like them at all. Yeah, and 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 I'm the same way. I I find the stories behind Ouija boards intriguing, um, and of course, if anyone watches the uh, Sunset Hill House that we worked on, they're they're was a case where there was some some activity related to one however um what i was going to say is <clears throat> they do use the ouija board a lot at that house because mm-hmm. they have a lot of or I, I think they do don't they they do well you and i weren't even aware of the ouija board no. at all until Rhonda had mentioned that some people were there a week prior Mm-hmm. And that they were playing with the board. And she said that when they pulled the board out, the house just, you know, basically flipped, you know, crap. Mm-hmm. And it was skyrocketed. And they were getting all sorts of crazy stuff happening. So I remember when you and I were first talking about using it, we didn't want to use it, you know, like, you In know, the traditional as you would. Sense. Yeah. We yeah. want to use it simply as a trigger object because I think our theory was, you know, what would happen if we went right up to the edge, but didn't, you mm-hmm. know, go fully into you know the Ouija board mode which you know Mm -hmm. I think the Ouija board is mostly it's like a like a placebo effect I Mm -hmm. think it has to do more with your belief and expecting Mm -hmm. something to happen Um, I think the only Ouija boards in existence that would have any power to them are the old original ones that were Mm -hmm. handmade Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, I have a Ouija board in my closet and, mm -hmm. you know, it's cool to take spooky photos. I've yeah. done Ouija board sessions by myself. I've never had one thing happen, not a single thing. But the fact that we did use it as a trigger object and, mm -hmm. you know, things did go off the rails, you know, it does make you wonder, you know, is it that they were pissed we were using it? Is, you know, were they using it as a portal or is there actually something to the Ouija board on like a spiritual or, you know, metaphysical level? And, and that's what I wondered because, I mean, there's a lot of met metaphysical, they have medical physical, excuse me, metaphysical <laughs> events there at that mm -hmm. house a lot. And, um, you know, a lot of work in that realm. Um, I, I thought it was actually a pretty interesting because, you know, I like to look at things from, from that point of view uh, as far as, you know, using items as a trigger item and using them in different ways. Cause I'm a firm believer you know, people will often talk about like the spirit box or they'll talk about different mm -hmm. tools and they'll say, oh, it's junk science or whatever. Right. I'm a firm believer if a spirit is going to communicate, they can use uh, any tool they want yeah. to get your attention and to communicate. It's, you know, we just really scrutinize the, the evidence and everything. So I was actually really, you know, when we, you and I discussed that and actually seeing okay, you know, if there's something to this, can this essentially be used as a trigger, but not us being used as the medium, which right. would typically be what's used during a uh, spirit board session. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a firm believer that um, the those voices, because I'll tell you right now, I didn't get those kind of voices the, <laughs> when I went back. I didn't have the board out. I never got it out. Yeah. And um and I feel like having it sitting there and maybe it was even us acknowledge it and talking about it, you mm -hmm. know, but I feel like um, for some reason using it as a trigger item actually really worked. And it, you know, I think so. That was, I don't remember if I asked you, cause I remember you saying you were going back for, you know, a follow-up investigation. Mm -hmm. Did you question Dr. Nickerson or did you, you know, ask if he killed anyone or anything like that? I did. I did. So, um, so, you know, we went and investigated there in March and, mm -hmm. um, like I said, extremely active night. And one thing I, you know, as most of you know, most of the time I'm a, I'm a solo investigator, um, mm -hmm. and I'll collaborate with, uh, like-minded folks. And so I really kind of looked at this after we went, the activity was so interesting. I wanted to actually kind of test and see <clears throat> if, the activity is could be based on the people you're investigating with or if it was all jake's fault that's right that's right <laughs> and so uh, of course you could look at that and say it was all my fault <laughs> but um i wanted to test and see what it would be like to go back and uh, do some of the same experiments and try it either you know with myself or with somebody else mm -hmm. and um just kind of compare the two but then also look and see what's different and what's the same what was the weather like um mm. i went back in june so obviously you know we a were in different. a totally different season a little bit warmer mm. um but we were also um i need to double check the moon but i wanted to to see if the moon you know if it was a similar phase just to kind of test some different elements and see uh how it affected and and then also just just to be transparent i was concerned too that because of all the battery drain and camera failure that I was having, I was concerned that I wouldn't, that I didn't capture everything that we had going on as well. Right. So, um, so I wanted to make sure to highlight this location and uh, some interesting stuff happened when I went back, which we're going to, we're going to release uh, next week, which will be uh, part two of all this. But, um, but I want to make sure to get to, I want to get to this question right here. Um, Nancy says, explain Jake the boundaries for the game. All right. So typically with the Ouija board, the theory is that by touching the plancha and inviting the spirits to move it, manipulate it, that they can draw upon the energy of the people in the room, touching the plancha and kind of, you know, manipulate the board essentially. Um, the problem obviously with that is when you really think about it, it's partial possession. Because you're asking the spirits to take you know, your hands on the planchette. You're asking them to take control of your hands. Because there's some people that believe 
that, you know, the spirits are controlling your hands to move it. And then there's some people that believe the spirits are like an extra set of hands you can't see. Um, if you want to believe that they're controlling your hands, that's disturbing because, you know, if they're partially possessing your hands, what's stopping them from partially possessing you? And that's basically skipping the steps of infestation, oppression, mm -hmm. and that's basically going straight to possession, which is a huge no-no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever I use the Ouija board, the I've done four Ouija board sessions. Most of the time I've been alone. Um, all the times that I've done them, aside from one, I've had my hands off the board simply mm -hmm. because even if it is, you know, a load of crap, just in case something mm -hmm. happens, I do not want to leave myself open to mm -hmm. that, you know, partial possession because I have been oppressed. You know, I've never been like partially possessed or anything, but I have felt the effects of oppression. It's one of the worst feelings you will ever have in your life. Like if you thought you felt sick before, this is different. You feel like you're a third person spectator in your own body. And it's just, it's a disturbing feeling. So, you know, to keep yourself from experiencing that, highly recommend it. Um, but the boundaries that we set for this investigation for when we used it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's fairly standard because we use it as a trigger object. So our mm -hmm. hands weren't on the plan chat. Um, we did set the boundaries. You can't touch us or anything like that, which, you know, mm -hmm. they obviously didn't listen to that. But that's the general <laughs> boundary for uh, doing a Ouija board session. And I'm sorry, my cat is tearing up a box. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear that, but he is tearing it up. So, um, but, uh, you know, Dee Dee says, um, I thought you were channeling through the, I thought they were channeling through the user. So channeling through is other. also kind of what I meant by, you know, possessing your hands. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can use the word channeling, but mm -hmm. channeling is essentially the way I've always thought of it as it's, you're being influenced to do something. Mm -hmm. which might not be possession or par even partial possession, but it still falls under the category of oppression mm -hmm. in my mind. Um, you know, you, everyone watching this might have a different idea and say, you know, Jake's wrong. You know, he's Jake's being sensitive, but you know, that's how I see. And so I'd rather mm -hmm. not do that. Mm -hmm. um, but whether or not they're channeling through you to do something or they're manipulating your hands, it's still something you don't want to happen. You're still opening up. Exactly. And that's yeah. the difference, you know, people say, what's the difference between EVP and spirit box? You know, we're not saying, you know, touch the spirit box, hold on to it together and mm -hmm. let's talk. You know, mm -hmm. you're asking them to speak normally. And we just hope that using these, you know, white noise or EVP that we can pick them up. You know, so it's yeah. very different. There's not that physical connection to it. It's uh, to me, it's like any trigger item that you find in a location, <clears throat> whether you use cigarettes at a jail and you're mm -hmm. asking them to either smoke the cigarettes or, or you know, do whatever. Um, it's it's the same kind of thing in using it in that sense. We weren't using it as, um, you know, send us a message. I mean, we did say, I mean, I was hoping they would move it. I was, I was hoping they would move it on their own. Yeah. Because to me, it, you're not using yourself as a conduit at that right. point. Um, whether the conduit be channeling or taking possession. It's also kind of like the Estes method in a way. Mm -hmm. um, with the Estes method, if the person, the person that's listening through the spirit box and, and has themselves blindfolded, they're essentially, instead of the spirit box being the medium that puts it out there, you're, you're putting out there what you say, I mean, what you hear, what you right. sense and what you're experiencing. So, um, so, I mean, it's, it's just a different way. You know, I was speaking to some people over in uh, Great Britain and something that actually I found quite a few of those folks do when they use their Ouija board session. Um, and again, this is a whole other topic for a whole other time. Yeah. But um, they use a glass with a marble mm. on it rather than a planchette which is really it's, cool it is really cool when you think about it because they're taking that human element out of it mm -hmm. and not um and essentially having the spirits use the board in a way like we ask them to use dowsing rods and use the white noise of a spirit box or mm -hmm. um, any of the other tools it's taken that human element out which can take out any type of false positives as well right. as any potentials for um for any type of uh, possession or yeah, channeling. It's, it's much know. safer. Yeah. 
and but people have opinions anyways that they can be opening channels and and all that but um the fact of the matter is i, I thought it was an interesting trigger item and uh and it worked it, I, I feel like it did, it did. I feel like <laughs> a little it, too well <laughs> yeah yeah and you know i can say again you know the question was asked last night is that something that we will add to our toolbox for me no um yeah. You know, if I go to another location that's known for having, say, for instance, seances or whatever in that location or something that they did back in the old days, mm -hmm. um, I would be open to having it as a trigger item again, yeah. but not um, not to sit around the table and try to do. I just feel like mm -hmm. I just feel like you open thing, and this is just my belief system. People see things differently, but I do believe when you do that. You know, I'm there to really kind of talk to the reported spirits that are um, that are in in this location all the time or connected to this location. I believe that when you use the spirit box like that, you're essentially opening up to other spirits who may not be connected to that location. Yeah. So then some of the things you're communicating with, it's it's not organic or it's not germane to that particular location and and that's that's completely why i don't like using it because i don't really feel like it is a true representation of the spirits who may be in that place right and you know that theory might explain you know the kind of activity that we got that night mm -hmm. i mean that that's a very good theory yeah that's just how i've always believed and i like to try to keep you know my my situation kind of to what's there of course, you you're, you know you never know what other people bring in and and that sort of thing, um, and and what could stay at that location. Um, and, this is and, gonna sound really bad, not to interrupt. There are no. times when I have, what was it? The first time we did a private investigation at St. Albans, we decided uh -huh. to do an EVP session. It was like three o'clock in the morning. We were in Demon Hallway. It's just my dad and I. The person we were with had went home. She got sick. It was awful. Um, but we were in this dark middle demon hallway, end up having a dark experience there a few years later. But we just got the feeling that, you know, our lives were in danger and that something bad was about to happen. We're just in there, pitch darkness, no sound, we're doing EVP. And I looked at my dad and said, you, I kind of want to turn the spirit box on, you know, that sound, <laughs> it sounds really stupid, but you kind of feel like that sound is almost like, like a safety shield. You know, yeah, you've turned yeah. a blind eye to what's happening around you. And that's not something you're supposed to do as an investigator. But I think sometimes that could be another use, you know, for the spirit box. You know, if you're feeling mm -hmm. uncomfortable, unsafe, and you need to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of take your focus off what's going on around you paranormal, you need to recenter yourself, mm -hmm. you know, you know, turn on some white noise. <laughs> sort of diffuse, you know, because I, I yeah. sort of feel like that. Uh, I had a conversation with a friend who um, we were investigating the Bel Air house mm -hmm. and it was just the two of us. And it was a very, very odd night. And um, I was going to go. We were hearing stuff walking. We were on the, the first floor. We were hearing stuff on the floors above us. And there were right. two floors above us. And so we couldn't figure it out. So I had told her, I said, I'm going to go up to that second floor. Mm -hmm. and walk across and I want you to listen and see if that's what we're hearing go up there and she's like no 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 that's too loud and so I was like well I'll go on up to the third floor and so I go up on the third floor and as soon as I start walking up there and of course we got our walkie talkies I go yeah. up on the third floor and she's like oh my gosh that's it and instantly <laughs> I'm just like Ooh. <laughs> this is a little creepy like, that's so not I'm, supposed to happen <laughs> no and so i'm like okay i'm gonna talk to you on my walkie talkie as i go downstairs mm -hmm. and so once i get down there we were talking and we were both feeling really uneasy in this house yeah. and so she told me she was like as soon as you left i got my camera out and i had the camera going because she's like nothing happens when you get your camera out <laughs> so, <laughs> so kind of that set, diffuse the situation and uh, yeah. be safe because, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, you know, you'll, you'll catch something, but if not, you know, you've got your camera there for safety. Yeah. Um, that's your Blair Witch moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, one more question about this and then we'll, we'll move on to something else. Cause I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the Ouija board because again, anyone that watches my stuff knows that's that to me, that's not a tool that I use. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, but, mine's collecting dust under my movie posters, so <laughs> those are my thoughts. <laughs> well, again, when you start researching the history of it, I had a guy, I listened to a presentation on the history of the Ouija board, and it's it's actually a very fascinating story of how it went from what it was to a game to, uh, well, a game. It was I mean, a parlor tree. It was, you yeah, know, like the seances game? of them, the Fox sisters and all of them did. Uh-huh. And then, you know, about, I remember hearing stories of, oh, you know, you're supposed to burn those, but you use a certain mm-hmm. kind of fire because they'll like, you know, build, burn like green or purple smoke. <laughs> and you hear a lot of those stories from the older generation, you know, their mm-hmm. parents used to tell them that, you know, it's, it's kind of the same vein as, you know, when Elvis came on and they thought, mm-hmm. you know, rock music was the devil <laughs> stuff. I always, you know, very respectfully kind of, you know, lumped it in with that kind of thing that, you know, it was such a, the spiritualist movement changed America in a lot of ways, but it's amazing how quickly we got away from that. Mm-hmm. The and, you know, we, panic of the 80s. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the spiritualist movement, you know, you had Abraham Lincoln, his wife, you know, Mary Todd was taking ghost ghost photos in the White House and doing mm-hmm. seances. So it was it was a big national movement. And then you get to mm-hmm. like World War One, and, you know, just no one wants anything to do with it, really. Yeah. Well, that's where know, a lot of these Ouija board stories come from. It, exactly. I mean, because when it was originally created back in the Victorian and Puritan times, mm-hmm. it was actually used. It, it was interesting because, you know, they, they wouldn't. It was used as a game between the two. And like they were able to actually touch hands. And so yeah. it's almost like this sexually taboo <laughs> thing because <laughs> they could they could play this game and they were able to touch hands. And so, um, you know, it's just interesting. And then the like you said, the progression and then the 60s when some of the um, leather skin Ouija boards and mm-hmm. some of those things. And again, like the, the satanic panic of the uh, 80s, it's, it's just interesting how, you know, how it evolved over time and the intention, how that goes into it. Um, yeah. But what I was going to say, the one question that I did want to get to, and then we'll kind of start to wrap things up. But Cody says, uh, how do you ground yourself? That's a really, really good question. Um, Every person has their own way of grounding themselves and protecting themselves on an investigation. Um, Usually what I do is before an investigation, I state my intentions to the spirits. You know, that kind of grounds, you know, my intentions, who I am, why I'm there to the spirits um, so that they can do with that information what they will. Um, after that, I usually, after I do my walkthrough, do some filming, I'll walk outside. I actually say a prayer, you know, a quick prayer, mm-hmm. ask for protection for me, everyone there throughout the duration. Um, and then after that, when I first go back into the location, I'll usually close my eyes and just picture, you know, white light all around me. It's, you know, very common white light technique and it, it works. Um, but basically you picture, you know, white light emanating from you, almost like a shield and it grounds you into the ground, imagine as if it's like roots of an old tree spreading out. And the farther it spreads, the safer you are. And then it comes back up, channels through you, your chakras, and then it goes up into the sky, you know, protecting, you know, through the heavens. And some people say you can do that at the beginning of investigation and you're fine. Some say you can do it at least once and you're fine. Um, usually I do it three or four times during an mm-hmm. investigation. And then at the end of it, I'll usually do reverse of what I do when I get there. I'll walk through and say, thank you mm-hmm. for, you know, thank you for mm-hmm. communicating with us. We appreciate it. You know, mm-hmm. we're leaving now. You are to stay here. You know, you are not allowed to talk to us or anything, basically closing that door of communication. And mm-hmm. then I'll still imagine the white light around me. You know, as I'm leaving, I'll say a prayer for protection as I leave the house or area. And then I'll say a protection, you know, going home and beyond. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what I do to ground myself. I like that. I like that. You know, I'm very similar in that respect. Um, you know, I always do a prayer of protection before. And I always, when I go in, I as well state my intentions. I don't mind when I'm in a place um I, I invite the spirits if if I t- as long as they don't hurt me, I yeah. don't care if they touch me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know some people, but you have to set your your bounds. Right. And I know some people don't um, 
They don't want them touching them, period. And and I totally respect that. But I mm-hmm. feel as though I, I do, it, and it depends on the situation, but again, I will assert myself if not, but I always set my intentions and what um, can and what, what is and is not allowed. Mm-hmm. And then um, for me, I just try to remain as calm as I can in these situations. Um, and I think that a lot of that does play from the people you're investigating with. Um, right. I did used to be a member of a team. And when, you know, for me, it was important. The people we were around, it was like, you know, no drinking, no, um, essentially no bad attitudes and stuff like that mm-hmm. when you're going into an investigation. Nothing that's going to alter the way that um, you feel and the way that um, you react in these situations. And so, um, so I try to, again, try to be as calm as possible, be as respectful, yeah. but like you, honestly, um, I'm praying a lot during, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. And so I'm continually praying during my investigations. Um, you know, when, when things are happening, whenever I go into a session, I'm always, whether I state it out loud or, you know, I- internally, mm-hmm. I'm, I've always got a dialogue going um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, my, my protection and that sort of thing. And then yeah. as I leave, I'm always very thankful. I always, you know, make the statement, you know, you're, you're not allowed to follow me. You are bound here. And then yeah. also, um, I'm continually doing a prayer the remainder of, of the time when I leave. So, and usually yeah. that one's a little more audible. It's usually audible when I get there and audible when I leave versus more yeah. internal and, and in my mind and stuff when, when I'm at the location. But every person, you know, is going to have their own approach to it. So, you know, you mm-hmm. might be listening to ours and say, you know, hey, I like that, but I'm going to do this different. That's perfectly fine. It's, you know, whatever makes you feel more comfortable, safe in a situation, as long as you aren't hurting yourself, the location, mm-hmm. or those around you. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And I think that that adds a lot to, to the location and why we get some of the stuff that we do when we're there because you know i look at it a lot whether whether it's negative activity or i don't even want to say negative but whether it's aggressive activity or a positive activity you know my goal when i go is to try to make communication and right. try to see if some of these different stories and history that we're there for to see if we'll get communication and yeah. uh, the, you know and that communication comes in all different forms whether it's mm-hmm. an, you know knocks and bangs or you know, scratches and pushes, you know, it, it all comes in. Uh, uh, and, and then some of them, you know, when, you know, they want to get you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put that on a shirt one day and it's just going to be, go. I'll gut you. <laughs> but, you know, looking at investigation, like it really makes me wonder, you know, my favorite and darkest location is St. Albans by far, mm-hmm. you know, if our investigation at the Nickerson State House, a place I thought was kind of tame, <laughs> was like <laughs> that, you know, what would happen if, you know, doing a St. Albans and, you know, that's, I think the next location I want to hit. I'm going back there on Halloween night for their public event. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. I'm excited. Especially since I have, they've given me a new mystery to try and solve. And yeah, it, it's interesting. They've got this new spirit there that I think someone summoned during the uh, COVID lockdown. Mm. And it's been a mystery. Find out who did it, why they did it, and what exactly it is. Because what it is, I've never seen anything like it before. I know so. you had a crazy night. Um, you oh, know, it was I, insane. <laughs> I, I had my first time there in April, and uh, I'm actually going to be going back uh, to Enigma Cons and speaking and investigating there um, in April. And I will be there for that. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I'm going to be there in 2021 of, of April and uh or excuse me 2022 <laughs> get out of 2021 but uh 2022 of april and uh hopefully maybe you and i can set up an investigation before that mm-hmm. and that would uh, be awesome check out that place because i know that's one that of your favorites and some one that you have connection to so yeah. uh yeah saint albans is is it's different it's, very very different it is you know i didn't know what to expect when i went there um because you know, I, I had only heard a few stories. I had talked mm-hmm. to you a little bit about it. And um, 
I really didn't know what to expect. And it's like, oh, it's probably really big and a little overwhelming and such. But um, it was it was cool. It was cool. And mm -hmm. uh, we I was there with uh, I did a lot with Alan May that night mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, Steve Deals and Alan Marsden. And um, we got some some really weird things, you know, and, and interesting. They were definitely wanting to interact and of course i went off by myself and investigated for about three hours by myself yeah and, which uh, is not the world's greatest idea especially no, when, it, it was, when it's on <laughs> it was creepy and I, I was live most of the time and so mm -hmm. uh it was uh, it was pretty creepy so but we'll definitely set that up and um i'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up here in a few minutes you know thank you everyone so much who joined us in the chat room who watched the show last night. Um, a lot of you have reached out to me uh, last night and today. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, you enjoyed the episode and, um, you know, sending your positive feedback and stuff. So, so thank you so much for the likes, follows and shares and, um, and your wonderful comments. Thank you for tonight. Thank you, Jake. I know uh, this is, it's, it's an honor to investigate with you and it's an honor to sit and, kind of chat and relive that investigation um if, it feels like such long ago i know I mean, it was right? only in march it feels like yeah. it was a year or two ago yeah yeah so i mean um you know it it was uh it was it was a blast doing and being introduced to such a neat and interesting location if anyone wants to investigate the nickerson sneed house i do definitely highly recommend reaching out to uh rhonda coddell and um setting up an investigation um you know you you won't be disappointed even if you just go in and get lost in the maze of the house mm -hmm. um you won't it be is a maze there yeah and um <clears throat> and again uh we got a new episode that will be coming out next tuesday night um and as i mentioned at the start of the show i actually got an extra episode this season since i made you guys wait an extra week we got some um, interesting stuff this season. So that's coming up. And then I just wanted to take a brief moment and actually share just to just to help get the word out. Um, as, as I had mentioned there at the beginning, we've got some um, cool things coming up. Let me see if I can get that to share. Um, some really cool things coming up at the uh, historic Scott County Jail, which is essentially my second home now. <laughs> and, um, you know, we announced our <clears throat> our after dark events, which include public ghost hunts, flashlight tours and uh, paranormal in, or private paranormal investigations. And then also Halloween crafts at the jailhouse, um, trying to do something for um, for kids. That's going to be this Saturday and next Saturday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time. We've got all kinds of really cool Halloween crafts that uh, you can bring your your kid to the jail. If the weather cooperates, it's going to be out. <laughs> it sounds really bad. Yeah, take your kid to jail. You know, exactly. I would deserve it anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, we're going to be having uh, stuff there in the jailhouse recreation yard. Um, a lot of really cool crafts. Like I said, that will be this Saturday and next, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Or if when crafts run out. And then, like I said, as far as the after dark events. Um, <clears throat> those can be, um, I've got a lot of different, and all of these are, are up on the events page. Um, we have a bunch of different flashlight tours, public ghost hunts that are being, um, uh, ran by myself with Ghost Biker and Dr. Christy Sumner, my business partner with Soul Sisters. And so we have a lot of those scheduled throughout the month of October, and those will carry into, um, uh, other months in the year, but right now we're really hitting it pretty heavy with up until Halloween with the ghost hunts. And so you need to um, book those online before, uh, before the time. So I just wanted to make sure to kind of plug that since we got that going on and we're really trying to get the word out about it. And it's, it's a lot of work getting the word out, but, um, but again, you know, we appreciate everyone that um, has booked and everyone that has shared because I know several of you have, have booked investigations and such. So anyways, like I said, we will definitely um, <clears throat> go ahead and, and end this and we'll get on. And um, next week I'll be sharing the second part 
of the Nickerson Sneed investigation and um, got, got another live stream next Thursday night as well. So, uh, so anyways, until Tuesday night, I hope you guys uh, have a great rest of the week. Watch out for motorcycles and uh, we will uh, see you guys soon. Y'all have a good night.